Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video, we're kicking off a series on Tennessee Williams's tragedy, A Streetcar Named Desire. Firstly, analysing each scene and then digging into the characters and the themes that run through this text. Before we dig into what's happened, here is how Williams introduces the setting of Elysian Fields in the opening stage directions. These are both beautiful, lyrical and poetic, and the function of this poetic narrative description is for those of us that are readers, not the theatre audience. For those directors who will be ensuring the set is staged exactly so. So let's go for it. And as I analyse, I'd love for you to use the chat in the comments section as an opportunity for sharing your own interpretation. Williams tells us the exterior of a two-storey corner building on a street in New Orleans, which is named Elysian Fields and runs between the L and N tracks and the river. Informative, but also deeply powerful. To be told it's set in New Orleans gives us a huge clue that this is a diverse metropolitan urban landscape. It's named Elysian Fields. The street being named that is steeped in Greek mythology. Elysian Fields is the paradise for the fallen great dead. It has a symbolic nature that permeates right through to the tragic heroine that we're about to encounter. Blanche's fate, is it that of a fallen hero? To me, this has a morbid decay feel around it. She goes past cemeteries and lands up here. You'll note in my key that I've labelled three areas that I'm analysing here. I think it's great to um, see the way that Williams weaves so lyrically these ideas and really compels us from the start of this play. Of course, these are stage directions, as I've already said, that are designed for a reader, but they still give us such a rich sense of the place that he wants us to bring to life as we watch as audience members. Um, the section is poor, but unlike corresponding sections in other American cities, it has a raffish charm. So there is tension here. Times are tough, but we're told yet again Beauty is juxtaposed with decay. It's got a raffish charm. What do we mean by that? Well, I would argue that there's a character we're about to meet who's compelling but rather grim. Like maybe Mr. Kowalski himself. This setting has a charm but is dangerous and dark. We're then told the houses are mostly white frame, weathered grey, with rickety outside stairs and galleries and quaintly ornamented gables. These houses were beautiful once. We're told they're mostly white frame, but they're weathered grey. They've lost their shine. Could this mirror in some way Blanche herself, the embodiment of the decayed nobility? There is certainly a feel of something quite sinister in this landscape, even if it's hard to exactly pinpoint what it is at this stage. I think the fact that the adjective rickety is used suggests that it's it's fragile, this landscape. It is not in good keeping condition. We're told that it's faded white stairs again all the clues we need that things are falling apart. But the beauty of the quaintly ornamented gables and galleries that once existed beautifully is still there, but maybe a shadow of its former self with this weathered grey, faded, rickety feel around it. We're also told the timeline of this space. And it inverts what a lot of plays do. The season we're in is early summer. 
and it's the first dark of an early evening in May. And by the end of this play, we've ended up in August. It's a really interesting and striking time to end and start a play. It's a difficult one to find closure in. The sky that shows around the dim white building is a peculiarly tender blue, almost a turquoise, which invests the scene with a kind of lyricism and gracefully attenuates the atmosphere of decay. Well, we know straight away what that means, but let's dig a little deeper on this tender blue, almost turquoise. There's a sense of beauty in this tender blue. It's almost turquoise. It's got a kind of lyricism, which I'll come back to in a moment. The tender blue definitely pairs up with what we will encounter later in these stage directions of the blue piano. There's a certain uh, beauty here in this tender blue, but there's an uneasy juxtaposition between the sky that is bright and blue, but it's peculiarly so. And that adverb peculiarly heightens this sense that something is not right in this setting. Yet we're told there's a kind of kind of lyricism. There's a clash here. There's a clash. Is it the clash of nobility and the metropolitan, whether that's Blanche and Stanley and what they represent? Is it a character who doesn't fit in, a fish out of water, as some would say? It looks sweet from afar, but the closer we get, the more we see the atmosphere of decay. This next description is fascinating too. The pollution that we encounter, you can almost feel. This is the moment I think we see the senses really brought to life. You can almost feel the warm breath of the Brown River beyond the river warehouses with their faint redolences of bananas and coffee. So let's begin with this image of the warm breath of the Brown River. So it's pollution that makes this river brown. And we've personified the river there. Williams is doing this to bring the whole atmosphere to life. But as if that wasn't enough, it's this huge consolidation for us of the impact of this environment, this metropolitan place being quite damaging. So you could even argue this is another moment of beauty versus decay. But also beyond that, the, the issue that we come to bear with is the way in which faint redolences of bananas and coffee are, are pictured. It's a very sensual image. Perhaps it's an almost claustrophobic impact of the senses on um, Stanley and Stella. It suggests that you can't avoid what's on your doorstep in this space. It's so cramped, there's so much going on. After all, we're between the l and tracks and the river, so everything is on top of itself. What's clear, though, is that we are on a journey of sensual engagement here. And what's next for us is to consider the sounds we hear in this environment. And he launches into what we see first, then he moves into what we can feel, and now he's moving into what we are hearing. A corresponding air is evoked by the music of Negro um, entertainers at a bar room around the corner. Forgive my highlighting. In this part of New Orleans, you are practically always just around the corner or a few doors down the street from a tinny piano being played and the infatuated fluency of your of brown fingers. So there's, there's two things going on here. This is the first of several stage directions that make it abundantly clear, like we're a diverse space. We are really welcoming of different ethnicities in a way that in other parts of America in this time is really a challenge to see how that could be so. But the use of this language of 
the music of Negro entertainers. It's of its time. We wouldn't phrase it like this now, but it's an image that takes us to a certain moment. It represents diversity also, this whole image of um, the tinny piano, this kind of rugged materialism of the 20th century. This is the changing cityscape. It's the growth of industrialization. It's OK for diversity here. And then the next image, this blue piano expresses the spirit of the life which goes on here. So we already know that the blue piano means something sensory. It expresses something in this space. So it expresses diversity. Maybe it also expresses what I'm calling beauty versus decay. The spirit of the life which goes on here. We're told two women, one white and one coloured, are taking air on the steps of the building. The white woman is Eunice, who occupies the flat upstairs. The coloured woman is a neighbour. For New Orleans is a cos... Oh, it's very intentional now. Can you feel it? We're getting smacked around the face with it. It's a cosmopolitan city where there is a relatively warm and easy intermingling of races in the old part of town. So three things to pull out for you here. One is like Blanche ain't going to fit in here. This feels very different from her hometown. But crucially, this intermingling of races that's kind of forced into the stage directions and stated that New Orleans is a cosmopolitan city. Um, it says a huge amount in terms of Williams intentionally telling us that Blanche's outmoded orthodoxy is just they ain't no home for it here. She's going to be confronted by what she will encounter in this space and she's going to need to move with the times if she's going to survive here. This is a space where you have to survive. It's also a place where people get on well. The fact that we see um, the white woman, Eunice, and a coloured woman who's not named for us yet, um, mingling in this way would be seen as different. And it's a symbol of diversity. Forgive me, to me that's not diversity, that's not anything too spectacular it's what I'd consider normal now so I didn't highlight that but I thought that was significant for us to see the kind of pattern that's rippled through our analysis I think it's very interesting that the final stage direction of this section above the music of the blue piano the voices of people on the street can be heard overlapping again a reference to the blue piano there's a kind of I'm calling it an overlapping sensory diversion here you know, the, the blue piano, is it threatening the integrity of the individual? Are we stepping over into the voices of others? In this case, it's Mitch and Stanley that we will meet soon. But there's an intensely poetic description that's beneath all this. And to me, it, it really sets the scene. There's such a bohemian atmosphere that's shared. You know, the French Quarter saw many immigrants settle in this district. It's made it more vibrant, bohemian. In its own right now, it's a tourist attraction. But you can see the heady mix of what we're encountering. I dare to consider that this play sets the scene from the very start about senses overwhelmed, beauty versus decay. It sets some clues about characters we're going to encounter. And it certainly sets the bar high about the need for any audience member or reader to be ready for diversity to not be a big deal. Williams is certainly setting himself out in 1947 as a playwright with an agenda for a more modern America.